So if you've been a fan for MMA for quite a number of years, I think you will start to notice a cycle, maybe within yourself as a fan, or maybe with the experience of other people and how they consume it on a weekly basis. That is if they continue to consume it on a weekly basis. So in other words, whether it was the George St. Pierre era or the current Conor McGregor era to the Khabib to the Islam era to the Tom Aspinall and the Ilya Tapora era, one thing remains for sure. The appetite of mixed martial arts fans is going to continuously cycle. In other words, you got people that watched from the George St. Pierre days that may not watch MMA anymore. And the same thing during the Conor McGregor era. If you've noticed the explosion that they had in 2016 as a result of Endeavor buying the UFC from uh, the uh, Zufa company, which was owned by Lorenzo and the Fertitta brothers, right? Using Conor McGregor as sort of um, a way of hiking up the price for the company. And lo and behold, he was very valuable. Why? Because those people that I had mentioned are the ones that really drove up the sport in that particular time frame. If you guys remember 2016, which was literally the biggest year of combat sports, if not specifically mixed martial arts. Nowadays, you would say that boxing is the overall king just based on the Saudis investment in the entire sport. However, Back in the days, yes, it was 100% Conor McGregor that drove a new fan base into the sport. And as a result, I got to be honest with you, those same people are no longer watching the UFC the way that they did back in the days, especially when Conor McGregor was at his best. So it's important to know that. Now, why is this important to know? Because I got to tell you, weekly, the UFC is saturated with a huge amount of cards in terms of the amount of fights that they have to put on and the amount of events that they have to put for ESPN. And as a result, sometimes it leaves you sort of burnt out with the saturation of the enormous amounts of events that they put on weekly. So sometimes you may take a break. Sometimes you're not gonna watch every card Sometimes you got other things to do on a Saturday. So you're like, you know what? I can skip out in this card and do something else. Maybe some people go to a concert. Maybe some people go shopping. Maybe some people go to the mall or do other loads of activities or just watch a different sport. Maybe boxing or perhaps maybe basketball or whatever that's available out there on a Saturday night. And by the way, I'm talking mostly to the hardcore MMA fans because you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You guys are the ones that may watch the sport on a weekly basis. And even if you're those people, I guarantee you there's a few weeks where you're like, man, I'm going to take a break until the big event. Sort of like 300 is coming up, right? So maybe you're not going to watch any of the UFC cards up until uh, UFC 300 because whatever they have going on right now, well, it's just not worth it for your time and effort. So... All of that, now that I'm mentioning this, out of nowhere, sometimes insane things happen in these fight nights that you miss out. And this is the important factor that I want you to understand as I go into the four minute mark of explaining to you why I'm telling you this. So the biting gate that had happened earlier tonight, never been happened in the entire history of the UFC or so they say. Right Before I go into the men that had gone on to compete that night and talk about their performances. And by the way, one guy, the guy that bit was the one that was winning. I want you to put that in context before I really go into that. Igor Severino was disqualified against Andre Lima. And by the way, he was winning the fight and then he bit him. Why did he need to do that? We don't know. We don't know what type of psychological issue that this gentleman has. We don't know what type of uh, state of mind he was in, nor do we understand what had motivated him to do it in that heat of the moment, in mid-combat. So we really don't know. 
But what we do know is that there was a time in history where there were no rules in the UFC, and this is really where I wanted to take this conversation. Speaking of the fact that there is an oversaturation of this entire sport, and the fact that there's a lot of fans that cycle in and out every generation, depending on which era we're talking about, I got to disclose to you and say, you know what, I'm not always going to watch all the fights, and neither will I be able to cover an entire card all the time. I try to. For example, if you guys want to check out on the description below, I have the entire prediction and preview from five cards leading up to UFC 300. In other words, from the fight night last week to this week to the week after that, and then the week before UFC 300, and then UFC 300 in and of itself. I made a prediction and a preview for all those events, including tonight. And to be quite honest with you, I don't do that all the time. And the thing is, are there other MMA content creators that do every single fight in a card? Yes. However, sometimes it may not be conducive to the role that your channel plays. What if your channel is more of a news-based? What if your channel is more of an opinion-based? What if your channel is more of a fan club base? Maybe you like a specific fighter or a specific group of fighters. Whatever your particular niche is in the MMA community space of YouTube, you have something different to offer. And it can't be just every guy is going to make predictions and make previews and then talk about the technicalities all the time. I can do that. I've proven that. I've shown that. If you've watched the channel long enough, I've done that. But what I also do is talk about the sensationalized stories the psychological motivations behind it, and more importantly, the history that comes with this particular story that we're about to talk about, and other stories that I talk about and the other historical artifacts that I bring about when it comes to mixed martial arts. So earlier tonight, right, I had a conversation with an old Muay Thai coach of mine. This guy used to train with a lot of guys that had fought back in the uh, no-holds-barred days of MMA, right? This was when MMA was bare knuckle. Well, anyways, this is what he wrote to me on Facebook tonight, right? I'm going to read to you guys. I think this is very interesting and sort of gives you a glimpse history into MMA and the experience that other fighters and other uh, MMA enthusiasts have over the years, and this relates to the biting that had happened tonight with uh, Servino and Andre Lima. If you guys just uh, follow me here, okay? So, even old school rules. No biting, no owl gouging. Don't know if any of you youngins were around when groin shots and fish hooking were legal. Fish hooking meaning you could take this right here, put it into someone's mouth or someone's eye, and that was absolutely fair game right? Same with soccer kicks. They were all legal. Obviously, they were legal in pride. And interestingly enough, in this conversation, I bring up pride FC to Jeff in my experience watching it as a teen. So I said to Jeff, yeah, I'm 38. I'm going into 39 in a couple of months. I was literally eight years old when the first UFC came out, 1993, eight years old. Oh, wow. Jeff says, you do know we were all fighting no holds barred long before Art Davies begged for people to fight in the first UFC, or at least I hope you know that. I do know that, Jeff. I do know, and I'm telling you guys right now, in full disclosure as I'm filming this to you guys, is that, yes, there were no holds barred fights all around the world before the UFC. It just so happens that the UFC had a specific platform that allowed them to get onto pay-per-view and perhaps maybe give them a better chance of world notoriety than, let's say, other leagues around the world. Uh, even in some of the 1980s movies that you've seen with John claude Van Damme, where he competed in Hong Kong, in Asia, and places like that, these things were around. And they were ran by the triads, the uh, Yakuza's, and all the underground uh, nefarious actors that you could find in Asia that were involved in all sorts of things. Similar to Daniel Kenahan uh, today and similar to the characters that Bob Arum had dealt with when he was 
coming up as a promoter, or better yet, coming up as a DA district attorney, taking down promoters that had mob ties back in the days when he was first coming into the promotion game, literally even before Muhammad Ali turned pro. But anyways, so Jeff asked me, yeah, I hope uh, you knew that, that there was no holds bare a knuckle fighting mixed martial arts uh, freestyle fighting competitions that were around and present way before UFC, yes. I, I also said to Jeff, I think the UFC, like many fans, even in that time, were the ones that introduced me into what is known as NHB, no holds barred fighting, or as MMA as we know it uh, today. I was a fan of the WWE, just like everybody else was, right? Uh, while I was also uh, training Taekwondo, literally at nine years old and uh, wrestled from fifth grade all the way to high school. And by the way, I didn't realize that doing all those arts meant you were literally doing uh, mixed martial arts, right? Which obviously they had sort of coined that phrase. Uh, however, I think because of the groin strikes and these insane no holds barred moves that you could do such as fish hooking our young, inexperienced brains really couldn't connect those two as to say, like, okay, what you do in Taekwondo or freestyle fighting is literally the same as what they do here, except there's some realism to street fighting in that. And by the way, when you're in a street fight, it's not implausible for anybody to go and bite you if they want to get away from you. These are all strong possibilities that can be done against you. Anybody can be bit. At any time, especially at close range positions, which is sort of what you saw with Lima and Serviano uh, tonight. So, I also had mentioned um, that in between watching the UFC as a kid uh, to my teen years, then I started watching WCW, a pro wrestling league, which by the way, as you guys know, if you know anything about WCW, they had collaborated with the Japanese uh, pro wrestling organizations back in the days. They even had a little invasion angle before the NWO had came into 1997. And prior to that, maybe in the early 90s, they had a Japanese league come in there and try to take over WCW. So it was literally almost the same kind of storyline, right? So with that, with Japanese pro wrestling is sort of where my introduction to mixed martial arts around the world other than UFC sort of took me, right? This is where a lot of people had found uh, pride fighting championships. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of my friends growing up, when they watched pride fighting championships, they would sort of look at it and say to themselves, you know what? This is kickboxing, isn't it? It would mis be mistaken for kickboxing. And I often wonder why, and I think maybe the boxing ring has a lot to do with it probably has a lot to do with it. Uh, so even before 1993, yeah, I had no idea about any other fighting organizations out there other than the UFC. That was until later on when I started watching uh, the Choke documentary with none other than Hicks and Gracie, uh, who came out uh, right, just, uh, right around YouTube uh, when YouTube really started popping off worldwide. We're talking about like the 2009s and 10s era when I saw that, I was like, wow, okay, for sure there were other MMA leagues back in the days in the early 90s, even before uh, the UFC. So Jeff also said to me, he's like, no, it wasn't doing all these arts. No holds barred type of fighting has been around since at least the 1980s, probably even earlier. Uh, there were fighters uh, that trained in multiple disciplines and few who had trained in one judo wrestling uh, BJJ were already around and fighters trained in as early as 1988. Paris uh, Catton trained in BJJ boxing and was a collegiate wrestler who also fought a few of the Gracies in the 1990s and 1992. So in other words, what Jeff is saying here, there's a lot of guys back then that were really well-rounded and sort of put it all together. Sort of like that other guy, uh, that guy Todd, who was also featured in the uh, Choke documentary. He was a Muay Thai guy, but also had wrestling skills. And it was a no limit type of a uh, weight class situation. So he got a pretty big advantage. But you guys watch the Choke documentary, see what I'm talking about. Maybe I might just put it in the descriptions down below if they even still have it out on YouTube. So what else does he go on about here? Okay, so 
Oh. Collegiate wrestler also fought the Gracies in the 90s. No UFC then and was fighting in Valet Chudo. Rings, No Limits, ISKA's original Strike Force after the show fights. When Scott used Strike Force as a martial arts demos after ISKA kickboxing and Muay Thai fights. Fairtex put up the ring and bunkered. Noom, Alex, and George were on those fights, but NHB fights took place afterwards. A lot of us also fought for money on barges, aircraft hangers, wow, hotels, etc. When Art Davies went around looking for fighters for his UFC, we often laughed at him because we already knew he was showcasing Royan and his family, which is basically the Gracies, and it was a joke. And it was in Japan that Funaki and we were getting ready for uh, the pancreas. So let me just stop there for a second and uh, kind of interject on this, right? So, okay, so what he's talking about is obviously the first UFC was just a demonstration for the Gracies to show that uh, BJJ worked, right? And that was it. And by the way, I know that you guys are probably thinking, oh, you know what? I thought you're supposed to talk about this fight that had happened. Okay, we saw the fight. We know what happened. He bit him. Okay, great. Now we're going to go into history with that. If you want the other technicalities of other fights, guess what? I have the video on that that you could check out as well. Full prediction, breakdown, previews with everything from last week's fights all the way to UFC 300. But for now, we're going to talk about a very sensationalized story that I think we could build around and also talk about MMA's history and its outlaw past. And not only that, it's quote-unquote, no-holds-bare-knuckle days. Are you not entertained? But anyways, so yeah, he thought that it was a joke. Uh, Funaki and I were getting ready for the King of Pancreas tournaments. Ken wasn't going. He changed his mind. He rescheduled. He was rescheduled to be another bracket. Uh, fighting was going on long before the UFC. And then uh, Jeff goes on to say, I'm sure I or my father have pictures of me with Herschel Walker from the 1990s. Him and his wife were uh, fighting back then. It uh, was crazy to see him fighting in like 10 years. Wow. So, okay. Basically, he's going on about how Herschel Walker fought here. Okay. Well, yada, yada. You own gladiators. Okay. And uh, like I said, man, if you want to know uh, more info, we can talk on a phone. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, maybe I'll uh, hit him up for um, something like that. Uh, yeah. He was. Wow. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Maybe, yeah, maybe that other stuff I shouldn't uh, be able to read. Okay. Anyways, anyhow, I'll tell you this, okay? Again, it's not weird for the history of at mixed martial arts to see uh, people biting, right? Although it is. And once again, when you see something like that happen, man, you got to think to yourself, this is a good night of fights. Are you not entertained? Now, I understand this is out of the norm, but guess what? When out of the norm things happen, you pay attention and you don't really care about anything else if you're just one of those people that looks for sensationalized stories, right? But once again, if you want the kicks and the punches and the technicalities, I have a video for that as well on the description below. But if you want an entire content that gives you a dopamine high based on sensationalized stories then you've came to the right video but you've also came to the right channel for both so don't forget to like and subscribe for not only all the technical breakdowns all the sensationalized stories all the breaking news events current and past and present and historic and all the stories that i can provide for you in the most objective matter that can be. Inshallah. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next video.